Moving on to our second session, I shall now call upon Dr. Kaleem Khan, Consultant Dermatologist, Surya Hospital, Mumbai, to kindly take uh, the stage and share his insights on management of ichthyosis. Over to you, sir. Good morning, everyone. The quiz got everyone fired up, so that's good. Um, so I'm Dr. Kaleem Khan at the odds, uh, Outside, I would like to thank Dr. Sandeepanda for giving me this opportunity to be a part of the Pediatric Expert Dermatology Summit 2.0, and of course, Palsons for organizing the summit. I'm supposed to talk about management of ichthyosis, and briefly, we'll talk about some concepts in ichthyosis, followed by topical and systemic treatments, a little word on holistic management, and some take-home points. So, ichthyosis can be both inherited and acquired, and most of the time acquired ichthyosis is either disease-induced or drug-induced. But we'll be speaking on inherited ichthyosis, right? And inherited ichthyosis is a heterogeneous group of keratinizing disorders, and they can be very different genotypically and phenotypically, but they are grouped together because they have this clinical finding of persistent scaling. And it is more due to improper desquamation of the epidermis rather than epidermal hyperproliferation. Many ways to classify this, but a simplistic way to remember this would be to divide ichthyosis in a group where there's predominantly skin involvement versus those which have other systemic disorders or involvement along with the skin. And that would be a syndromic presentation and only skin involvement would be non-syndromic presentation. It is further subdivided depending upon the mode of inheritance into autosomal dominantly inherited ichthyosis vulgaris that we see so often uh, and X-linked recessive ichthyosis as the name suggests is X-linked recessive. Recently, an umbrella term is being used called autosomal recessive congenital ichthyosis which clubs together this lamellar ichthyosis, congenital ichthyosis form erythroderma, harlequin ichthyosis into one group. On the other side of the slide, I've mentioned some syndromic presentations. Of course, this is not an exhaustive list, but something that we see more often. And the reason why I have mentioned this is because one important point to remember is that all ichthyoses are not the same. And it is very important to identify what the underlying genotype would be so that your treatment can be more specific and the outcome even better. So when we think about ichthyosis, right? When we think about ichthyosis, we think of dry scaly skin, increased transepidermal water loss, associated with itching inflammation. So the goals of treatment are exactly that. We want to restore the moisture. We want to restore the skin barrier. We want to relieve the itching inflammation and overall improve how the skin looks. And to achieve this, there are some important points that we follow and that would include some bathing tips, use of topical moisturizers, keratolytics, retinoids, and in some patients even systemic retinoids. So let's talk a little bit about all of these starting off with the bathing routine. Something very simple, something that you have to do every day, but something very important for your patients with ichthyosis. So of course the skin is very dry, scaly, so you would want to hydrate the skin, you want to soften the skin, so frequent bathing is recommended and soaking the skin is recommended. So ideally instead of a shower, you want to give a bathtub kind of thing, bathing routine. Ideally twice a day is recommended. You can make it into a steam bath or a bubble bath. It has shown to be slightly more beneficial than just soaking. Adding some additives into the bath, including say colloidal oat, bran, helps to soften the skin even further and help to remove those scales. So mechanical exfoliation should be attempted only after soaking the skin for about 15, 20 minutes or half an hour. And you want to use something gentle like a microfiber towel or a silk cloth in older children with slightly thicker scales, you, can, you may even use a pumice stone to gently tug away at the scales and help to remove them. No bathing routine will be complete without the use of a bland occlusive moisturizing agent after the bath, right? So that has to be used. So that brings us exactly to what are the topical treatments. Um, moisturizers and emollients will be discussed later on in the session. So I won't speak about it, but let's talk about some keratolytics and retinoids. Uh, this slide talks about the important topical agents that can be used in ichthyosis. 
So the keratolytics are something that help exfoliate the skin. So we talked about mechanical exfoliation, then there's chemical exfoliation. So the commonest ones are alpha hydroxy acids like lactic acid, glycolic acid, beta hydroxy acids like salicylic acid, and there is urea too. Sometimes you can combine, so there are moisturizers lower down on the slide. If you see moisturizers, you can add propylene glycol along with a varying percentage of lactic acid to achieve both hydration and keratolysis. The important thing to remember is that keratolytics, of course, irritate the skin. And ideally, below the age of six months, you should not be using topical keratolytics. Stick to bland emollients for that age group and only then look at keratolytic agents. Again, understanding the possible uh, type of ichthyosis, you want to use keratolytics or retinoids. So what I mean by that is lamellar ichthyosis would benefit strongly from having keratolytics of a slightly higher percentage. But ichthyosis vulgaris, they don't like extra keratolytics because of that underlying ATOP that is there. Um, again, there is always that risk of salicylism when applied on a larger body surface area in younger infants, so obviously you should avoid using keratolytics in these kids. Uh, topical retinoids, we have first, second, third generation in that the first generation tretinoins seem to be some of some benefit, but adapalene has no role. Tazoroutine, yes, definitely has a role, again in older individuals, but in very strong lamellar ichthyosis or harlequin fetus, it can be used immediately within the first one, two months of delivery, right? Again, an important point to remember is that all moisturizers are definitely not the same. So when you pick and choose your moisturizer, you want to know what is the composition of the moisturizer, what is the concentration of the actives in the moisturizer, and then probably prescribe to your patient. Uh, coming to systemic treatments, of course, everyone knows the, the one thing that comes to your mind when you think of systemic treatment for ichthyosis would be retinoids, right? Systemic retinoids like acetretin, e-tretinate, or isotretinoin. So e-tretinate no longer used, alitretinoin not available for us. Isotretinoin, not as effective as acetretin, but can be used in a specific group of individuals. So acetretin typically is used in the dose of 0.5 to 1 mg per kg per day. But that is not a blanket statement. Depending upon your diagnosis of ichthyosis, what I mean by that is, suppose the diagnosis is uh, bullous ichthyosiform uh, erythroderma, right, which is also known as epidermolytic ichthyosis now. So the naming convention has changed a lot in ichthyosis because of better understanding. So these patients, when they present, they have very delicate skin, almost like epidermolytic as the name suggests. If you give retinoids to these, systemic retinoids to these kids, it causes increased skin fragility and makes the condition worse. So you probably want to start off with something as low as 0.25 mg per kg per day. But at the other end of the spectrum is lamellar ichthyosis or harlequin fetus and you want to give as high as 1 mg per kg per day. So you want to titrate your dose, you want to identify the condition that you're treating and systemic retinoids may not be for everyone. Like let, Netherton syndrome, you don't want to give systemic retinoids. The other point to remember is that retinoids have their own set of side effects. And you will be giving retinoids for a longer time. So the, most, the side effect profile of retinoids is directly proportional to the dose of retinoids and the duration of therapy. And of course, these children will be taking it for a longer period of time. And the dreaded side effect that we want to know about or we want to keep in check is skeletal abnormality. Not abnormality, skeletal side effects. And of course, the one that we talk about is premature epiphyseal closure or bony hyperostosis. Um, well, most of these side effects have been defined with acetretin of with e-tretinate at a much higher dosing. Now that we know, we probably want to stick to lower dosing. So the dictum is the lowest dose of acetretin, which will give you the benefit without the side effects. That's what you want to aim for. Of course, hyperlipidemia and elevated transaminases levels have to be watched out for, right? The other very important thing that systemic retinoids can do for you is um, in some patients of auto re autosomal recessive uh, congenital ichthyosis, it can actually improve their sweating because sometimes the sweat glands are blocked and they are unable to manage um, tolerate heat. Um, 
yeah if i wanted to mention something there is uh, in the previous slide i mentioned this thing called ramba ramba very exciting thing that is retinoid acid uh, retinoic acid metabolism blocking agents they are supposed to be the next step in retinoids where they help to stimulate endogenous retinoids so they have a very favorable side effect profile as opposed to systemic retinoids that we give um very exciting times for ichthyosis because with recent immune profiling we are now able to understand the pathomechanism where things are going wrong so we can give targeted therapies like enzyme replacement therapies small molecules gene therapy uh, these are in various uh, stages of trial as early as um, preclinical or even phase 2 trials I also wanted to mention something about this uh, landmark paper published by Amy Paller talking about the TH17 response in a subset of ichthyosis patients and why this is important is because we already have biologics which target that system so IL17 inhibitors like secukinumab and ixekizumab and maybe even 1223 inhibitor uh, inhibitors like uh, ustekinumab they do have some role to play to reduce the inflammation and improve outcomes in patients with ichthyosis again you have to choose your patients correctly a uh, very busy slide but i specifically put this slide because it talks about how the skin care changes depending upon the age of the child right so we are just talking about in general up to now i've just talked about in general but the management of a newborn baby with skin changes of ichthyosis is different from when the child grows up and when child becomes adolescent and older so uh, collodion baby but the most dreaded one is of course harlequin ichthyosis um so up till now probably two decades ago harlequin ichthyosis was considered incompatible with life right but that is no longer the case we are now able to talk about increased uh, life span for these patients and not just life span but improving quality of life for them so how did we achieve this with better understanding so yesterday uh, the last session of the day we were discussing should we even look at treating or diagnosing or going into these syndromes or genetic diseases this is one classical example why you would want to because with better understanding we can give better treatments and improve outcome for these patients so in harlequin ichthyosis we know or even in collodion membrane we know that uh there's this casing on the body of the newborn right making it difficult for the baby to breathe the um, the baby is unable to sweat correctly baby is not able to maintain temperature so when you want to manage such kids in the nic of course this is not something that the dermats do this is of course a joint effort between the neonatologists uh, the nicu people the dermatologists and so many other faculties so you want to look for because they, these babies they are unable to sweat and maintain temperature you want to hu look for a humidified incubator typically you want to have the incubator normally it is at a higher temperature right high temperature incubators but for these babies you want to actually lower the uh, incubator temperature uh the study done for specifically for ichthyosis uh, for harlequin fetus babies the survival rate now has increased to 55% and the mortality maximally within the first 3 months is because of sepsis or respiratory failure so infection is something that you want to look out for you want to manage these kids with uh, constant monitoring for electrolytes liver function kidney function and yes it is it is a, a combined effort systemic retinoids can be started in this should be started not can should be started early and you can combine with topical uh, tazo routine in fact there was a very nice study which talked about efficacy of topical tazo routine in reducing contractures both on the ectropion and on the digits which can alleviate the need for surgery sometimes you have to actually do fasciotomy or surgeries to release the contractures otherwise they go into compartment syndrome so anyway the point was that you have to change your man management depending upon the age growth and how the skin progresses So ichthyosis management does involve skin care both topical emollients some oral medications but it will never be complete without including lifestyle modifications psychosocial support and medical support from other faculties 
Most of the time we talk about dermatologists and pediatricians working together, but we have to include nutritionists, counselors, and then specific um, uh, faculties like ENT, like patients with lamellar ectosis, they can have blocking of the external ear canal because of excessive keratinization and they have deafness, progressive deafness, so they need to get their ears clean. Other times, patients may have associated eye disorders. You want to have your ophthalmologist check, neurologist, pediatric neurologist to check new, uh, neurological development for these because of syndromic presentation, they may have that uh, involvement. So holistic management, working together is what you need when managing patients with ichthyosis. Uh, I would really request everyone to go through this article by Dr. O OG. Um, which talks about more practical management for ichthyosis. Excellent, excellent article. Uh, so, uh, if I had to summarize uh, some important take-home messages would be ex these three. One is that all ichthyosis are not the same. Just we think of ichthyosis as dry scaly skin, but it is more than that. All moisturizers are not the same. Check the ingredients, check the concentration. And lastly, holistic approach is what you should think of when you plan to manage your patients with ichthyosis, right? Thank you. We did good time. Okay, just one or two comments about, sure. especially humectants. You know, we always talk about uh, humectants uh, as being, uh, you know, we talk about, let's say, 10% urea as being a humectant. Actually, it's not. So anything which is uh, 10 and above actually becomes more keratolytic than humectant. So 7% urea is actually better than a 10%. The second thing about humectants is if you are in a place where the weather is dry and cold or you're in t times of the year where the weather is dry and cold, if you apply humectant, ensure the child doesn't go out for the next 30 minutes. Or if the child has to go out in the next 30 minutes, apply an occlusive on top of it. And the best occlusive is actually petroleum jelly, which is the hydrocarbons, which is the solid form, or mineral oil, liquid paraffin. As a, as a liquid form. The only difference between these two, of course, um, ability to apply, but one thing we need to understand is that petroleum jelly that's Vaseline is actually not comedogenic, whereas it's, it's, it's anti antithetical actually, whereas uh, liquid paraffin, which is a liquid hydrocarbon, is actually comedogenic. So that's just for slightly older children. Thank you. I, I have deliberately not spoken anything about moisturizers because of a different session there. But moisturizers are the most basic form of treatment when you're dealing with ichthyosis. I'm sure the discussion will go on in the panel and in the subsequent uh, talk. Um, yeah, that's it from me. But yeah, all those points that uh, Dr. Manas just spoke about, very important. Okay, thank you.